All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, can everyone hear me? Well, all right. So my name is Owen Wilson Chavez. I am the Senior Analytics Associate at Building Community Workshop. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming out here tonight to hear a bit about housing in Dallas. Uh, the event this evening is sponsored by BB&T, so I'd like to introduce uh, Amy uh, to say a few words for a minute. much about BBNT. We are newer to the Texas area. We've been here since 2009, but BBNT has been a bank for basically a hundred and I just lost count, 145 years. So we've actually paid a dividend from the Great Depression through now for our shareholders, which is rare. So A, to have a bank that strong for 145 years and to be profitable for our shareholders is also great. So let me explain what BB&T's mission is, um, because this is what sets us apart. We are a bank that is as big as you need us to be, but we're as small as you want us to be. So what drives our decisions at BB&T is um, our mission statement. And our mission statement is to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. So when we decide to do a business decision at BB&T, we are looking at how does that affect our clients. Um, secondly, we like to create a place where our associates can learn, grow, and be fulfilled. So we train our, our associates to be the best of the best. Um, that way when our um, clients come to us, we can really sit down and be a financial, um, a, a financial advocate for them. We also, and this is one that's near and dear to my heart, is we make our, um, we make our communities better in which we work and we serve them. So we serve them through the Lighthouse Projects. Um, Kelly King, our CEO, allows each of our employees to have a bucket of money um, that is given to each associate. We all decide on a community project in which we are going to donate not just our time, but also what we get, donate sweat equity and then we use those funds that Kelly has given each associate to help our communities be a better place. And then we do all of that in hopes to optimize the long-term return of our shareholders. So um, that is our mission statement and what we do and why we do it. We are a full service mortgage company. So when you close with us, we service our mortgages. So whether I've had clients that I closed 15 years ago call me with um, a, a tax statement and say, Amy, I've got this. Can you help me get this to servicing? So that is the, one of the great attributes. Along with most of the traditional programs that you will hear as far as mortgage lendings, we also separate ourselves um, at BBNT with a couple others. We do service um, the low to moderate income or CRA areas. We have a product that is 90% loan to value, no mortgage insurance, um, and as little as $500 down. We have construction and firm lending, so one-time close, and we also do physicians loans up to 100% loan to value. So we, we can offer a wide spectrum to help our communities be a better place. We also want to say thank you very much for letting us be a sponsor. This is, um, I'm totally excited about the program this afternoon, so thank you very much. If you all have any questions after the program is over, myself and Angela will be here to answer anything for you. Thank you, Amy. Um, for those of you who don't know BC, we are we're building community workshop. We are a nonprofit community design center, uh, Texas-based, uh, that seeks to improve the livability and viability of the communities that we work in through the practice of thoughtful design and making. And for the past several years, BC has worked to expand access to quality, affordable housing for residents in the communities we serve, in addition to other work that we do. On one hand, we design units for low to moderate income families in Dallas, Houston, and, the, and in the colonias along the US-Mexico border. And on another, uh, we have identified barriers to housing affordability that we wish to address in Dallas. Um, one arm of this, through our Aim for Dallas program, is the production of an annual State of Dallas Housing Report, uh, arming our housing community, elected leaders, and residents with information to understand the myriad challenges to housing affordability in our community. Tonight, BC's housing associate, Patrick Blades, uh, will walk you through the most recent report, which we released on April 11th, which is the uh, 49th anniversary of the uh, 1968 uh, Fair Housing Act. Uh, so we're excited to release the report this year, in this month, in, in Fair Housing Month, 
Um, and following our presentation tonight, uh, Patrick's presentation tonight, uh, Roy Lopez from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas uh, will moderate a kind of panel conversation, not necessarily, uh, you know, panel discussion, but a conversation with Bernadette Mitchell, who's the director of housing for the city of Dallas, Demetria McCain, who's the president of the Inclusive Communities Project, and Scott Galbraith, who's the vice president at Matthews Affordable. Um, but first, I want to set the context for tonight a little bit. Um, at BC, we believe that all, re all people should be housed and that everyone should have their basic needs met. Housing should be affordable, it should be secure, it should be healthy, and it should be accessible. Um, it should meet basic standards for a healthy personal, social, and economic quality of life. Householders that spend, households that spend too much on housing have to make cash sacrifices in other areas of their life, either in terms of less food, less for transportation, less for health care, less for child care, things that really matter. And if you're a low to moderate income family and you have to make this decision, you have to choose between these buckets of things or you might face homelessness if, you're, um, if your income is interrupted or if your housing uh, situation changes. And children living in substandard housing face greater risk of illnesses uh, and lack of access to jobs from, from housing uh, preser pre can provide burdens to, to low to moderate income households. Uh, and when you have a city, when you have housing in a city that addresses these concerns, your city can, can thrive. And if you don't, it makes it much harder for, for parts of our population. And it's in this context that we began exploring avenues to increase the production of affordable housing units in Dallas through our Aim for Dallas program. So to expand on that and to dive into this year's report, I really want to hand off the conversation to our housing associate, Patrick Blades. Thank you, Owen. And again, my name is Patrick Blades, and I'm the housing associate at the Building Community Workshop. Uh, the state of does housing, the 2017 report, uh, I want to begin with by uh, kind of setting the tone. Uh, this report um, has been informed by more than three years of work. Uh, back in 2015, uh, to better understand the affordable housing ecosystem here in Dallas, BC undertook a program uh, that became Aim for Dallas, uh, in which we brought together local, regional, and national leaders on housing affordability to understand the ecosystem in Dallas, uh, understand ways in which we can make it better and make it more efficient. Uh, we conducted three of these different convenings, these housing labs over 2015 and 2016, uh, that again informed us uh, of the things that we can do better. Uh, one of the things that came out of those meetings was a, uh, a lack of information, a lack of data um, that uh, decision makers, elected officials, policy makers, uh, affordable builders, nonprofits, uh, the community itself didn't have some of this information um, about the affordable housing ecosystem. They, they didn't understand uh, really three different aspects. It was the people or the demand side. Um, the market that was there, uh, the people that were low and moderate income. Uh, there was also an issue with uh, kind of understanding the supply side of, uh, of, of what we have here in Dallas, the actual homes that we have in our community. And lastly, uh, we, it came down to an issue of not having data and understanding and information on access for that demand to that supply side. So the State of Dallas Housing, the 2017 report, explores those three topics, the demand, the people, the supply, the housing we have on the ground, and then the access, kind of the market uh, that affects how individuals that the demand side can access that supply. So we're going to begin with by talking about the demand, the people that live in Dallas. Uh, the city of Dallas is home to roughly 1.3 million people. Uh, they live in about 500,000 households. Uh, those households are very diverse. Uh, they can be uh, very large, um, you know, a seven-member family. Uh, it can also be a single individual, an elderly couple. Uh, the State of Dallas Housing Report uh, dives into the, uh, the people that live in Dallas in great depth, and I encourage you guys to download the report and read it. I'm just going to hit a few of the, uh, the big, the, I guess the, the most striking findings that, we, uh, that, that the report talks about. Uh, and the first one is income. So as Owen mentioned, it's very important that we understand the income of those 500,000 households because they need 500,000 places to live and they're constrained by the incomes they have. Um, again, as Owen said, those households who uh, have to spend more of their income on housing uh, are able to spend less of that income on child care, on health care, on medicine, uh, on food, on, on clothing. Uh, for this report, uh, we use the standard of ha affordable housing that HUD uses, which is 30%. So if a household is spending more than 30% of their income on housing, it's considered unaffordable. Now, this is an income breakdown of the city of Dallas households. 
Uh, and the section there in red is the section that we highlighted. Uh, those are households that are making under $250,000 a year annually. Uh, households that HUD considers extremely low income. Um, there are over 130,000 of those households. And when you break that down even more, uh, there are a majority of those households actually make less than $15,000 a year. We have 70,000 different households uh, in Dallas that earn less than $15,000 a year. That's not 70,000 people, that's 70,000 households. So 70,000 different housing projects that we need where you can, uh, uh, where those individuals can live and their monthly housing budget should only be about $400. So again, we need 70,000 houses at that $400 point. So when you look at how that income, uh, how Dallas's population uh, relative to uh, their, um, the, uh, their income, um, it paints a, a familiar picture to many of us who live in Dallas. Uh, this map is medium household income. The darker areas are the areas with higher income. The lighter areas are areas with lower income. Um, and as you can see by the map, uh, there are a number of individuals and in households that have a lower income that are living in southern Dallas and individuals that have higher income that are living in northern Dallas. So now let's talk about the big points about the supply side, um, really what we have, the housing stock that's available right now. Uh, when we started this report, uh, one of the things that we uh, realized very early on is that the data on the housing stock is scattered. There's no clear, concise catalog of what we have today in terms of how many homes, how many apartments, how many duplexes, and, and whatnot. So one of the first steps of uh, this report, uh, we catalog and map every single single family home, townhome, duplex, uh, and every single apartment unit. Not just apartment buildings, but actually how many units are there are in them. So to begin with, we're going to talk about the single family detached uh, homes here in Dallas. Uh, we have uh, approximately 225,000 of these homes in Dallas. Uh, the map there uh, on the bottom left, or sorry, your bottom right, uh, shows a concentration of homes uh, of, these, of this housing product here in, uh, in our city. Uh, it's, it's spread throughout northern Dallas and southern Dallas. Uh, one of the points uh, that we will just point out very briefly is that uh, housing stock uh, or housing development occurred pre-war and post-war at a pretty similar area in northern and southern Dallas up until about 1950. We start to see a stark decline in the number of housing units that were built in southern Dallas, uh, and that continues to this day. As far as apartments, we have 230,000 different apartment units uh, that are located here in the city of Dallas. Again, the map there on uh, the bottom right shows their location. Uh, they're located primarily in northern Dallas. Uh, part of that is because of the concentration in downtown, uh, also in the village and in uptown as well. As far as townhomes, condos, and duplexes, uh, we have 59,000 of those different types of housing products. Uh, the duplexes are spread pretty evenly about northern and southern Dallas. Uh, most of the townhomes are in northern Dallas. And the map there on the bottom right shows the location of condos. Uh, and with uh, very, very, very few exceptions, uh, all of the condos in Dallas are located primarily in northern Dallas. So as a whole, when we understood the households in Dallas and the housing stock in Dallas, uh, we have enough housing stock to house everyone that lives in the city. Uh, and the report goes into another uh, analysis to determine do we have enough of the pr uh, correct sizes of those homes, so the number of bedrooms versus household sizes. And again, we have, um, there's no inefficiency there. We have the appropriate number, uh, but really as anyone who works in a housing affordability will tell you, it's not about having the right number. It's about having those certain households being able to access uh, some of that housing. So it's the last part we're going to talk about is the actual access. What are the, the income parameters and the limitations uh, that that put on or that puts on uh, our various households here in Dallas? So this map here on the screen, um, or these maps on the screen, show housing affordability for three different incomes in Dallas. The low income there, uh, beginning and the middle income and then higher income. The areas that are darker are the areas in where you're more likely at that income to be able to find housing in Dallas. Uh, and what's, uh, again, striking about this is, again, if you're lower income, if you're making under $250,000, uh, or sorry, $25,000, which again, almost a third of our population is, uh, you're pretty much limited to southern Dallas. There are a few parkets uh, in northern Dallas when you may be able to afford. Uh, those are primarily located around larger aging apartment complexes. Uh, again, for the middle income households, you can start to see uh, some limitations uh, for access. 
in North Dallas and far North Dallas, and now beginning in East Dallas around Marwick Lake, and also pockets in, uh, in North uh, Oak Cliff as well. And then lastly, as you can see, uh, if you are a higher income individual, you're making $100,000 to $150,000, uh, you have a lot of choice about where you can live. Again, you can buy a home in Southern Dallas that may be a $50,000 home, or you can buy a home in Northern Dallas that could be a $450,000 home. So when you take a look at uh, the housing market relative to how, um, um, where our households are with um, um, regards to the race and ethnicity, um, the results can be quite striking. Uh, the map here on the left is the price per square foot of new homes sold or of homes sold last year. The darker areas are the areas where it's more expensive. Uh, the map there uh, on the right is a map showing the concentration of uh, uh, minority homeowners in Dallas. And as you can pretty clearly see, the areas where it's more expensive, we have far fewer minorities. Um, and the areas where it's less expensive are the areas in which more minorities um, have chosen to own a home or sometimes are, are limited in where they're able to, to purchase a home. So when you look at the market, again, what the market is doing today uh, to address some of these issues, uh, we see some striking and some, uh, some important information. So we did an analysis of all the homes that were sold in Dallas in 2011 versus all the homes that were sold in Dallas in 2016. And one of the most striking uh, numbers that we found was that the medium household price or sale price for a new home that was built in Dallas in 2011 was $145,000 which is affordable for an individual making thirty-five or $50,000. Uh, that number for 2016 was $522,000. So that's a pretty dramatic jump. And again, a half a million dollar house, a more than half a million dollar house, it's not just unaffordable for someone making $35,000 or $50,000 a year. Uh, the half a million dollar house is only affordable for 15% of our population. 85% of our population can't afford that half a million dollar home. Uh, one of the other striking things is we're building and selling more million dollar homes in North Dallas than we are building and selling 150, 200, and 250,000 dollar homes in Southern Dallas. Uh, so really the market is not addressing some of these issues, it's um, exacerbating some of these issues. Now, uh, public <coughs> policy can be a great tool to affect um, some change in the market uh, to address housing affordability. Uh, the city of Dallas uh, recently has taken some um, some, some very large and promising steps uh, to addressing housing affordability and they're to be commended for it. Um, a, lot of this, uh, a lot of those steps forward have been spurred by uh, court cases by ICP uh, against the state of Texas uh, regarding disparate impact, uh, voluntary compliance agreements between the city and HUD, uh, HUD's also um, new rules about affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, and that has all uh, kind of coalesced around a new policy, uh, a fairly new policy for the city called Neighborhood Plus. Uh, and so we wanted to take a look at after these, uh, these uh, I guess these events have occurred uh, this, and the city has uh, begun to think holistically about their housing policy, how has the city allocated certain funding for certain programs? Uh, and we looked specifically at six programs um, that are funded through HUD allocations uh, to address single family um, home ownership here in Dallas. Uh, we looked at the years from 2011 to 2015 and then last year, which was again the first year that the city operated in the new uh, kind of holistic approach to housing. Uh, and again, you know, the map kind of shows a similar pattern, uh, but again, it's only one year. Um, you know, we feel the need to point out that it's, it's only one year and that the city is um, currently undergoing uh, a new five-year consolidated plan or planning for that plan. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be an important uh, issue to begin to address to understand the effect um, of how we are allocating funding for different programs um, and the effect that it has in our community. So with that said, um, I, I know I, I gave uh, this report and I talked with the council member about this and he said, this is great, Patrick. Uh, what are your solutions? What are your recommendations? How can we move forward with this? Uh, how can we not just talk about this, these issues? How can we not just shine a spotlight on them but actually do something about them? Uh, and so BC has, uh, we, we have a number of recommendations in the housing report, uh, but I'm just gonna briefly touch on four different recommendations. Uh, the first, is to reevaluate the city's land bank. Uh, again, the land bank is a, a, a quality program that moves forward with taking vacant lots and turning those um, into single family homes. Uh, right now they're doing it at a pace um, about 50 a year probably. Um, and we believe that through uh, 
exploring the land bank program, um, you can make it a more efficient program and that you can utilize it in a more strategic way in which you can increase the amount of production for those single family homes. Uh, the second uh, suggestion is to encourage more market rate development of affordable housing products. Again, I talked about um, you know, that, that we're building half a million dollar homes or we're building more million dollar homes and we are building $200,000 homes. Well, the market for the 150, the 200, and the $250,000 homes is three times the size of that half a million dollar market. Um, so part of it is encouraging that development and showcasing that. Uh, in the State of Dallas Housing Report, we point out that the average price per square foot in a number of different areas uh, seems to match up very well with um, building costs or construction costs. And if you're able to utilize some of those, uh, some of that property, and again, there's a lot of that property, there's 19,000 vacant lots in Dallas, uh, utilize some of that property to, again, coalesce around this idea that you can do market rate housing uh, and that banking and lending institutions can explore ways in which they can make it easier for those smaller mom and pop developers uh, to build some of the affordable housing. Uh, thirdly, uh, again, as I mentioned, the city's taken a, a, a number of great steps forward, uh, and we encourage them to continue to take those steps forward, um, in particular to address some of the issues of uh, really the extremely low income. Uh, the two previous recommendations really are meant to address uh, home ownership. Uh, this one can address those who may not be in a position to own a home. Uh, in which we can pursue things like master lease agreements for voucher holders, um, income discrimination, uh, protection, um, and again, uh, doing innovative stuff like permissive accessory dwelling units or granny flats. And our last recommendation uh, is to continue to pursue uh, fair housing through all of uh, the city's uh, funding allocations. So um, exploring how you can further fair housing through general fund through bond fund and through all of the various programs that um, the city funds with HUD funding as well. So we believe that by undertaking some of those recommendations, others in the, uh, uh, in the report, um, that we can go about creating uh, a housing ecosystem here in Dallas that, as Owen talked about, is affordable, is secure, is safe, and is sustainable. And with that, I'd like to bring up um, o Owen Wilson-Chavez uh, to introduce our panel. Thank you, Patrick. So the way the rest of the evening is going to work is we're going to uh, have four uh, panelists and one moderator come up. Uh, and they're going to the, go through a conversation. So we'll take questions from you towards the end of the evening um, after we've let, let our panelists have a great conversation. So I'd like to introduce uh, Roy Lopez, who is the, uh, I don't have your title, wait, community development, community, community development Officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, uh, up to the front, wherever Roy is. Oh, he's right there. <laughs> So Roy will be sitting there, and then we'll have um, Bernadette Mitchell, who's the Director of Housing for the City of Dallas, Demetria McCain, who is the President of the Inclusive Communities Project, and Scott Galbraith, who's the Vice President at Matthews Affordable Income Development. Um, so we'll hand it over to Roy and All right, can, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'll, I'll speak up. I'll encourage my fellow panelists to speak up as well. Uh, but what a great panel we have here today, and uh, I'm really excited. But before we kind of get started, I, would, I thought I would ask, how many of you are homeowners? Homeowners, very good. How many of you live in the city of Dallas? Fantastic. The reason I ask that question is because when I think about home ownership, when I think about living at home, I think of two things. I think about stability. What's the number one reason families fall apart? Financial issues. I think about housing and stability, they go hand in hand. And building wealth. You think about building assets, the equity you have in your home, those are so critical if your goal is to build wealth. So that kind of sets, sets the tone for this conversation here today. So I'm gonna ask my final panelists here today. Demetria, thank you for being here, Scott, for today. Uh, what, what stands out from this report, from these recommendations? 
uh, each of you had an opportunity to read the report. What surprised you about housing in Dallas, especially given the data, given the facts that we all saw here today? Let's start with, uh, let's start with Bernadette. Um, well, I'm really pleased to see BC try to take on this, this data and this metric because it's true that within the multifamily, there's a research piece called MPF that's out there that looks at submarkets and kind of tracks on your, on your rentals or your multifamilies, but uh, not anything that I know of that separately tracks single family and not just the market and what's going on in the market, but supply and we kind of touched upon one thing in the report that doesn't surprise me at all and that's that there is pretty much no data on the existing housing stock conditions and for all of you who know in your neighborhoods you probably got some rundown house that has some boarded up windows and you're going why on the Dallas Central Appraisal District is it rated in fair condition you're going, that thing should be just torn down, right? Mm -hmm. So this kind of data, and again, I applaud them very much because this data is hard to come by. It's deep research. Even when you try to pick through the real estate council material, they kind of send you through an A&M database, which you guys picked up some of that. Uh, you really have to look at trend analysis, and it even gets into sub-markets around Dallas as to how quickly houses are moving uh, and the day-to-day -day occurrences. So I, I, I if anything else, I, I really applaud BC for taking on this task. Absolutely, absolutely. Demetra, what surprised you about this? Is this working? Sure, you can get this. Let's get this. There you go. Uh, let me apologize for my sinus infection. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand if you've had a sinus infection in the last month. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and raise your hand too. If you have driven around Dallas and you have seen construction of apartments as you turn the corner, then you see some more construction of apartments, you turn the corner. Are folks, am I the only person who has seen a lot of construction of apartments going on? Wow. Even in, particularly in this neighborhood, right? So, so it's not a surprise to know that there's been a lot of construction of new apartments, but it was startling to see the figure of 260,000 in 2016. Because I work with counselors who are constantly helping low-income renters, particularly those with vouchers, look for housing. Um, and we have not had many complexes open up to us. We haven't heard, oh wait, there's a new landlord in town. Our folks can move there. That hasn't happened. So when I see this figure of 260,000 more apartments coming online in a single year, and they are really off hands to people who are at the 50% or 30% area median income. That is a hurtful figure to me. So that, that figure itself was shocking. Scott, we'll turn it to you. What, what was it about this report that kind of stood out for you? The most striking thing is that we're sitting in one of the more affluent communities in the world and we have this problem. It's been so easily demonstrated that we have this imbalance in our community. Uh, as Dimitri just alluded to, there's thousands of apartments being built. But I did a little research today. There's been zero affordable projects funded by low income housing tax credits done in the last three to four years in the city of Dallas. So something, there's something down that's keeping us from addressing our issues. Uh, I think there's got to be a better way to find partnerships, you alluded to it in the report, uh, that can sort of counter some of those things. It's a very competitive, very costly thing to get into. And uh, we don't appear to be delivering the kind of housing that needs to be delivered across the community. Demetra, I'm glad you're here because I wanted to ask you this particular question. I want you to run with this one, which is there's this great debate in housing right now. Uh, and it really stands at the forefront. It's like the Democrats versus the Republicans. And it really has to do with on one side, there's the revitalizers that want to revitalize a community like Dolphin Heights, like Fair Park, like Pleasant Grove, like West Dallas. And they want to infuse capital in those communities. And then on the other hand, there's what I call the high opportunists that want to move populations from those communities to high opportunity areas like North Dallas and Preston Hollow. I think I know what side of the debate you're on, Mitra, but I would love to get your thoughts around this great debate that exists in Dallas. Where do we put our resources when we have very limited resources 
to give? So, so let's make a couple things clear. So um, in this debate that you talk about, I haven't heard of a debate where people are trying to move people to higher opportunity areas. I've heard of the situation, which is what we experience, of families who desperately want to escape the neighborhoods where there has not been sufficient city and public investment. Okay, that's a little different nuance there, but sure. an important one. Fair. Um, and it's really important to focus on this whole idea of reinvigorating, redevelopment, reinvesting. Uh, the, the city has for years said that they're going to you know, redo a neighborhood that needs help, and we have lots of those types of neighborhoods. We all know where they are, um, but they haven't done that. There's a, there's a 1991 report that was written to the city of Dallas, it's a planning report written to the city of Dallas, talking about what needed to be done. There are lots of neighborhoods that have, obviously, food deserts, very few retail options, very few businesses or job centers. And what the city has done, and that report is 1991, I would venture to say that those conditions existed prior to 1991, and I know they did because I was raised in Dallas, I've been here. Um, so what the city has done for the most part, and other partners as we talk about public-private partnership, is invest low-income affordable housing into those neighborhoods without doing some of the other stuff to bring those neighborhoods up. And that relates not just to apartment dwellers, but the homeowners, right? So the homeowners are living there. They have this mortgage. They're not going to up and move in a second because you're not going to get a new down payment to buy a new house in a second. But the question is, what has the city done for those neighborhoods? Right now, the city's put millions into reinvesting through the Galleria TIF, right? Which is up between the Galleria and Valley View. So we shouldn't say that the city has limited resources. Sure, they do, but they decide where to put their money. So while we're investing all this money into the gallery at TIFF, for instance, millions of dollars, um, we're not saying yes to securing the homes of the current low-income people who live there in, in well, housing that's affordable to them. We're not doing that. We're simply investing into this gallery at TIFF, a neighborhood that's pretty much um, not on par with some of the pleasant groves and the oak cliffs that you were talking about, right? So the city has money. But the city chooses to put the money where they like. They invest in these affordable housing deals in high poverty segregated neighborhoods with the hope that it's going to come up, right? And that's when the families who, who seek our help say, listen, I ain't got time for that, right? <laughs> They're saying, I cannot... I cannot wait for this long-term fix when my six-year-old is having to live in this neighborhood. And I'm having to deal with some of the issues that are going on in this neighborhood while the city gets its act together, while the other levels of government get their acts together. And so this whole thing about either or, it's just that. There are people who, who thrive on debate, who thrive on controversy. We can do it all, but simply putting public dollars into places that are high poverty segregated areas that have all of the affordable units already is not a way to lift up those neighborhoods. It's not a way to support those homeowners who would like to see, you know, a higher value of their houses, you know, when the city's not doing anything for those neighborhoods. And it's also not allowing that renter who has the ability to move to move somewhere else if the units are not accessible in the better resource neighborhoods. Right. And Scott, so that kind of leads me to another question. I was at a meeting uh, earlier today and uh, had an opportunity to talk to, to, to Bill Hill with uh, Habitat. And he basically said, we, we really don't have an affordable housing crisis in, in Dallas. He says, we have a, a housing quality issue in Dallas. And the housing quality issue is particularly uh, relevant for those making under $100,000 as a family. The plan pointed that out again. I'd love for you to respond to that assertion. Well, if the gentleman's here, I apologize. Oh, he's not. <laughs> That's why I brought it up. <laughs> I think it was pretty clear there is an affordable housing problem. I mean, if the numbers are accurate, we do not have enough affordable housing. The quality argument, I don't think is valid. It's cost 100 bucks a foot to build a house. $120 a foot to build a you know, multifamily apartment. For an investor to get a return on that investment, they need to charge a rent that is higher than 300 bucks a month. And if that's what people can afford, the ability to provide a house 
no matter how cheap I make it, 300 bucks a month is not going to pay the bills, and then I'm not going to be paying my mortgage, and I'm going to have BBT come back at me. So uh, I, I hate to be adversarial, but you know, I don't think that's accurate. I think there's more to it than just quality. There's, there's definitely got to be more ways to get resources to help people live in a better environment. So, Bernard, that, that brings me to this question, which is if, if you look at affordable housing, there's, there's really only four ways to do affordable housing. Uh, one is smaller housing, right? Uh, the other is density. You know, you, 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 pro you probably have to pack families in. Uh, the other one is, is subsidy. But the fourth component, I think, is, is really important, which is this concept of innovation. Uh, how can a community like Dallas be more creative and innovative in its approaches to affordable housing. We talked about the land bank. We talked about uh, other, uh, like uh, land trusts, for example. What is innovative in Dallas that you're, you're holding a lot of high hopes for? Well, let me start off by, by saying that, you know, just evidenced by the people here and the folks that are in the profession, it's not as simple as, you know, flipping the switch on or off. It's not the simple turning the spigot and the water comes out. There are a lot of moving parts to housing. One is affordability, and the report speaks to if you're paying more than 30% of your income on your household expenses, your, your payment, your interest, your taxes, your insurance, or your rent and utilities, then by HUD standards, you're paying too much. I don't know how many of you all, but we find that even in the higher income brackets, people will extend themselves to pay too much for their housing costs, which makes it unaffordable, right? So that's an affordability issue. The other is availability. So if there are no, and the report speaks to that too, which is if there are no available units within your price point, there's nothing for you to rent or buy, okay? So how do we first, which one do we address first, right? So if we, if we look at the housing market and how hot the market is right now, and I think uh, I've seen figures anywhere from a house might stay on the market 20 to 30 days. Can you imagine? In a month, a house is already spoken for and probably closed within another 15 days uh, on the market right now, despite the fact that uh, credit scores have gone up, right? The requirements for your uh, credit have gone up and the requirements for down payment have changed. Um, and most lenders in this area are pretty conservative, right? So they're gonna look at how much you can afford, but they're gonna try to place you in just the right house. That's just to say the housing market's hot. So do we address availability and speak to not just, uh, let's say folks under 80%, which is most of our uh, HUD funding, requires that you're at 80% or below. So let me just, kind of give you an idea. At 80%, a single person would be making $41,100 or less. Okay, if you're a two-person household, $47,000 or less. And that's the HUD standard by which you can get some type of assistance, right? Um, and so that's just to say that's that number. Now when we get into different uh, funding sources, we might be able to get into higher brackets to help an individual. There's also ways to help developers uh, speaking to something uh, that was mentioned earlier in terms of subsidizing developers to either bring their costs down, do some creative um, ownership situations, uh, which we have in Dallas. Uh, and several of the pictures uh, I noticed from BC uh, are showing a project that is um, Girly Place, right? It's seniors' apartments where the city owns the dirt and the developer owned the vertical pieces, the actual improvement. And what happens there is the property is tax exempt from the land perspective. That makes the cost cheaper for the developer and the ongoing ownership of that property and then allows them to charge less for their rents. So you say, well, why don't we do that just all over the city? Well, because I don't think that we've got a clear strategy for are we going to do this just with permanent supportive housing projects? Are we going to do this just with senior projects? And then, uh, speaking to Demetrius' point on multifamilies, we have had the challenges not only in court, but 
what's reasonable for offering folks opportunities to live wherever they want in Dallas, to access schools, to access jobs, to access transportation. Isn't that the most healthy balance that we can provide our citizens? And so that, again, sort of speaks to availability, not affordability. When we go for affordable, and I just, real quick, um, if we go for affordable and you're making 25000 or less, then I have to try to bring that house or that rent down to what you can afford at 30%. That's a different factor, and that might involve vouchers. That might involve subsidies um, to your down payment or your closing costs or your principal reduction when you buy that house. So lots of different factors, and there's lots of different creative things that we're looking at, including land trust, which is mentioned in the report, uh, and ownership of property by the city itself. Demetria, we've heard of politicians, business people talk about the Texas miracle. Texas miracle talks a lot about job gains in the state of Texas. They talk about land appreciation. Uh, I guess my question has to do with uh, what is the economic case for deconcentrating poverty? What, what is the benefit of doing that? In Texas, in Dallas, we like life. We like to live with people that look like us, that have income similar to us. Look at our neighborhoods. We're very segregated. And, and <coughs> how do we change the dynamic about that? How do we change the conversation? Well, I think at the end of the day, um, it's all about political will. We have got to have some elected leaders who have the guts to create and enforce housing policies that are fair, that give Bernadette's office marching orders to how they should structure their operations. Um, the issue is political will. There are things done in various parts of the country um, that, there are tons of things done in various parts of the country that we simply don't do. And we're here talking about the city of Dallas, but it's really important to understand the impact of the decisions in Austin on some of the things the city of Dallas would do. Uh, pending right now was a bill that uh, a, state rep, a state rep put forth, not from Dallas, a state rep put forth, really that would hamper and tie the hands of the city of Dallas as they try to create an inclusionary housing policy, for instance. An inclusionary housing policy is one in which as you build housing, you, and, and, and that particular developer gets a benefit from a city, then they also must, must kind of reply to that benefit and do something to help the lower income people, right? And so perhaps if, if a developer's building in downtown, for instance, um, something that generally wouldn't be affordable to somebody who makes uh, $20,000 a year, but yet they get some kind of benefit from the city, then they've got to do something to, make, to open up some units to people who are low income. And so things, political will on the state level, political will on the city level, and I venture to say political will on the county level are super important on these issues. And we're not gonna move the needle until we're able to do that. Thank you. And Scott, last question, then we'll open it up to the audience. But my question has to do with not in my backyard. It's, it is against the law to discriminate against a protected class but it's not against the law to complain about that low-income neighbor or that African-American family or that uh, low-income housing tax credit development moving next to your home. How do we combat that? Because in Dallas, that is a big issue. It is a huge issue in terms of killing very viable projects. Uh, how do we continue to change that conversation and talk about affordable housing in terms of who actually lives in affordable housing? Your, fire, your firefighters, your police officers, your teachers. Well, let me address that with two examples. When we developed our light tech project in uh, the Cedars called the Bellevue, that neighborhood objected to two previous applications for a light tech project. Uh, we felt that the neighborhood respond to our assertion that we were going to develop a high-quality product. Uh, we reminded them that under the rules, you are spending a minimum amount of dollars. I mean, you're getting a subsidy, but you're required to build a quality product. Uh, all new appliances, all new furniture, all new cabinetry, everything's new. 
Uh, when the first people moved into the Bellevue, and I was fortunate to be there for that day, there were a few people who were crying because they'd never lived in a new environment. They couldn't believe it. And when we start talking about those kind of projects elsewhere, we did a second project, or it's under construction now, in Hutchins. And uh, as we spoke to the city council, and they said, well, who's going to live there? It's like, just what you said. People who live in Hutchins will live there. The income bracket that will be in that apartment is the same income bracket as in the town of Hutchins. 7,000 employees in the Dallas Inland Port. They're driving more than a half hour, 45 minutes to get to work. There's no housing there. They get to live close to work, which reduces traffic, which makes them spend more time with their families. So if you can reduce people's travel, you can get them a more affordable house, uh, they're gonna have a better lifestyle, as was alluded to earlier. We know at the Bellevue, for example, almost half of our tenants work at the Omni Hotel. That was one of the major reasons we decided to go down that path. We talked earlier about building communities. I mean, in addition to Southside of Lamar, the Gillies condos, the Beat condos, Southside Flats, we built the Bellevue, which is one other piece in a neighborhood. And the Omni supported our application because they knew what they paid housekeeping staff, they couldn't live anywhere close to work. So we now have hit. half those people who live at the Bellevue work at the Omni. And on average, we've calculated they make about four to $5,000 a year more money, disposable income, because what they get paid, they're not paying in rent because the rent is geared <coughs> to income. So those people are one dark stop to work and they've got a $4,000 a year bonus. That helps them break that cycle of poverty. The next thing we gotta do is put more daycare in, but that's another story. Warren, can I comment on that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, and, and also, to, to your question about NIMBY, you know, NIMBYs will exist. But what's really important to distinguish is people complaining versus decision makers making decisions based on what I call race-based NIMBYism, mm -hmm. right? Um, City of Houston got in big trouble for some of that kind of stuff, which is a whole other story. But we, again, back to political will. You know, we have state laws that have have elevated the voices of the NIMBY folks to the point that if a neighborhood complains loudly enough against this type of a project, um, then in fact that can influence the state representative. And we have given the state representative veto power over these very local issues. Meaning that if, if a developer wants to get this type of a project done, they've got to get a letter of support or at least a letter of no objection from a state representative. Why is that so? Because the state legislature passed that law not too long ago, right? And so we're giving these veto powers. The same thing exists for city council. If something is already zoned multifamily, a, a regular private developer can come in and build some apartments. If something is already zoned multifamily and a developer wants to build apartments for low-income people under this tax credit program, they've got to get a letter from the city saying, yeah, we support this. And that is impacted by what I call the race-based NIMBY folks. Why does that exist? Same thing, because it was our state that passed something that created that requirement. Would you do away with that provision? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. We have a city official we have an advocate, we have a developer. Great, diverse panel on housing issues. Now it's your turn. Not a time to be shy. Bring out your questions. And I will start calling people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. My question is about the lack of infrastructure in, in every way in South Dallas. Um, I, I asked a representative of DART at Earth Bay, Texas, why can we not have a South Dallas on call like we have Lakewood on call, which is where I have had it? Why can't we have that? What's stopping something like that? Because our nonprofit is trying is training people in a rapidly growing industry, trying to connect them to jobs, and one of the biggest I mean 40% of people in 75215 do not transportation. So why why are we in 2017 and we've had DART around for many, many years and I realize nobody's here from DART. I'm just saying, can somebody, you guys know the landscape a lot better than I do. 
why, why are we not investing in that infrastructure? And, and, and I realize that's one kind of infrastructure. But. Yeah, I think it still takes pressure from the public to let DART know that they are not satisfying your needs. Um, and speaking directly to the board members at their board meetings. Um, we entertained a meeting with them not too long ago talking about why don't they offer free service to seniors. Even on regular routes, it, it would be uh, reasonable to assume that uh, seniors are on fixed incomes, therefore it would be a great benefit to the city of Dallas and to their ridership and everything. Uh, and we had pushback, quite frankly. And it was like, well, we have reduced rate. Well, but that's not the same thing. Uh, in addition to the fact that the council has been pretty vocal about how DART has not satisfied the needs of the public in terms of timing of regular bus routes. How, if, you, if any of you ride public transportation, how long does it take you to get to a grocery store and back? Or, or to a, a health clinic visit or a doctor visit or to daycare or to your jobs? on public transit, and the council's been very vocal about that. I think you're gonna to start to see some changes, but again, I think it takes the public to go directly to DART and say, you know, City of Dallas is cutting you a really nice check. Um, you know, you need to start to address some of our needs. Yes, sir. How can we have affordable housing when the mayor and certain developers are against affordable housing? Specifically, Jim Schutz has written a number of articles about HUD the misspending of hundreds of millions of dollars of money that should go to affordable housing, the integration of Dallas as opposed to the continued segregation. It was reported that the mayor went up, met with Julian Castro, and they worked out a side deal, and now we have a new HUD. Ben Carson coming in, he was asked by Fox, by NBC5, are you aware of what's going on with HUD and misspending of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars? He goes, yes, I am very aware. So how can we, have affordable housing when the mayor and Schutz called him the number one enemy of affordable housing and certain developers are against politics, as you said. It's, it's, it's bigger than the mayor. It's the council, too. Yes. Uh, so so, so on, on issues of, of moving the needle on this affordable housing issue, on fair housing issues, we've got to get away from this fiefdom mentality. Right now at the council, council members, and this is not just this current council, it's gone on for years. Uh, if the particular council person is for it, then other council people will get on board. If the particular council person for the project in their, is in their district is against it, then other people are against it. We have one mayor. We shouldn't have 15 mayors. And so we need, again, political will to do the right thing, not to do the thing that's polite because, oh, this is your district, you want it, okay, I'll vote for it. Oh, this is your district, you don't want it, okay, I'm against it. You know, we've got to think about the health of the entire city. Demetri, are you saying that we, so there's several plans out there, including this one, but uh, the Urban Land Institute, the Real Estate Council, Housing Plus, there's a, we can go on and on about the number of plans that have been developed. Do you feel that there's a, a, a need for a comprehensive housing plan that outlines where our resources should be going to? Well, right now the uh, council's been working on a comprehensive housing policy. I don't think we need any more plans. <laughs> uh, we got enough plans. But we need a comprehensive housing policy that has been in the works for over a year. And I invite each of you to come on Mondays at 11 o'clock to 12.30, every other Monday, generally speaking, to the housing committee meeting. They say that they're going to, it's probably not going to happen until after the election. They say that they're going to get back on track and come up and finish up this housing, comprehensive housing policy. We need it desperately. So let me speak a little bit to the policy then. Uh, as I've worked with the council, and particularly Council Member Griggs, who chairs the housing committee, um, these have not been easy decisions to make, and so it has taken them uh, basically about a year and a half to get through different policy areas um, to where really regulation and some uh, incentive have come into play. I brought a few copies with me today of what they've done so far, kind of like an executive summary, uh, but I'll also have my cards if you want me to email it to you separately. Um, there are still a number of items to get through, including uh, voluntary inclusionary <laughs> zoning uh, that Demetri mentioned, 
Uh, we're also looking at accessory dwelling units, which right now is in uh, the zoning uh, group uh, for discussion and allowing that either by right or by overlay, so in different areas to allow affordable housing to occur like that. Uh, there's also still mobility counseling and things like that that we need to get through. Um, so it's still a number of policy areas. And again, uh, looking at a, and I'm gonna cut in between a plan and a policy and say a strategy. <laughs> and I'm gonna say the strategy because if we decide that availability is our bigger issue than affordability, then we need to sort of plow all of our resources into that. And it doesn't matter where the resources come from. Matter of fact, I, I too believe, and having worked with HUD many years, that the federal government has become very inefficient and very ineffective in, in providing us, the citizens, what we need out of our tax dollars or even out of our policy making. Uh, and so to that end, I think we need a Dallas strategy for how we're going to attack this issue uh, in making availability and affordability for our existing residents, but also making that available for the next generation and making it available for folks coming in. Quick question. Do we have the infrastructure? If we develop a plan, do we have the infrastructure in place to develop adequate affordable housing with the community development corporations that we have on hand? I think that we've got the resources. I know for a fact we don't have everything in place. I mean, I know that there are several areas in South Dallas you can go to, don't have water lines, don't have sewer lines, need that big infrastructure infusion. The next uh, bond election, which is being worked through the city right now, is calling for $60 million in both housing and economic development. And I can tell you, uh, I've got a developer in the back, I won't call him out, but <laughs> that we have specifically funded infrastructure for him to put in new housing. And that's going to be at an affordable and available price point. So we're looking at mixing the incomes uh, for anyone who wants to buy in the various areas. One last question. Uh, lady in the blue. <laughs> Since you paid for this. <laughs> well, okay, so I have been in mortgage for 24 years, so excuse my, um, me being new to Dallas. Um, I'm, I'm now here as of April 1st. So I've been with BB&T for, since 2000, but um, I was, you know, we had several programs available in my previous life um, to be able to help low to moderate income um, homeowners achieve the dream of homeownership. We got to see communities change and with the pride of homeownership. And so that's why I'm here tonight, to see what is available, um, what can I bring back to my, my originators, my staff, to say we need to make a change in the communities. Um, the tax amount has been quite a shock. Um, there's sticker shock for the tax amount that is in the Dallas and surrounding areas. So what kind of assistance do, is available for homeowners to say help with um, down payment assistance for that dream of homeownership. Where are those outlets that we might be able to connect with? So as you, yeah, so as you know, during the downtime of the market, um, a lot of the down payment assistance providers went away um, and a lot of rules changed for donations from developers for that down payment as well. And so uh, the city of Dallas has a long standing program uh, we've renamed it called the Dallas Home Buyers uh, Assistance Program, uh, and that provides right now up to $20,000 in closing costs, down payment, and uh, principal reduction. Uh, any lender can participate. Uh, it's online, so everything's available uh, for immediate registration of clients. Uh, and then we go typical closing into a lend, you know, into a title company. Uh, what we see out in the market, though, is we need money for that 80% and to the 100. Uh, Wells Fargo, when they were, uh, when they had the judgment against them and put money back, had to put money back into the market, they went from the 80% to the 120. And I can tell you that was very successful because we typically cover the 80 or below. And so that price point still, these are not your working poor, but you're working. And probably your entry level folks that still need that help in covering the gap of that down payment. There's also some state programs available yeah. through the Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation, as well as others. I, 
Okay, one quick question. It's the, so pr the pregnant woman right here. Pregnant. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. So it's, it's actually a compliment. Um, I love your passion. Um, I'm, I've been, you know, in the financial institution for 16 years, so kind of, kind of seeing the ins and outs. But I love the passion and drive that you have, and we need advocates like yourselves to speak for us to legislation. Politics will always be politics, but when it comes down to it, it's educating our youth now to change what can they afford. Right, so we have a financial wellness program where we can teach the kids, you know, what is what is a savings account, what is credit, what is interest, you know, what is every, everything, you know, to retirement planning. So it's going to come down to programs like that where people are giving back their time to teach the youth, right? So just obviously you're going to make choices that might be bad, that might be good, but you, you have a lot of families that want to make a difference. They want to improve their, their lives, their children's lives, and move to the next step. And I'm on the Richardson Chamber Board of Commerce, so I see a lot of these families that work, thanks to DART, they can work in Richardson. So you have higher income that they can bring back home. But again, it's just going to start with rebuilding, you know, the next generation. And teaching the next generation advocacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you stole my closing remarks. Yeah. <laughs> but let's give it up for uh, Bernadette, Demetra, and Scott.